all things D2 football, everything you need to know in week five that went down. Let's start with our pick for the game of the week this week in D2 football, that being the Wasps from Emory and Henry taking down the Bears from Lenore Ryan. 31-20 is the final, but it was a lot more interesting than that. Emory and Henry goes on and scores 21 points in the fourth quarter to end up taking this one, had an interception at the end to close it out and make things a little less interesting on the scoreboard. This game absolutely incredible very back and forth the first win over a ranked opponent in the wasps d2 era that itself is worthy of an applause shout out to these guys that is a massive massive win for this game down in the sac they outscored the bears 21 three in the fourth quarter as i mentioned both teams generating multiple turnovers enh able to finish with points lenore was not this turnover late in the fourth quarter that would seal the deal icing on the cake for the wasps if you will and uh you look at this game i think something that jumps out too the time of possession very lopsided lenore ryan possessed the ball for 37 minutes and 10 seconds and lost that's crazy. Emory and Henry, 22-50, picking up the dub, even though they did not really have the ball inside of their possession for the majority of it. As far as in, uh, individual performances go, excuse me, Cole Lambert under center for Emory and Henry, maybe not his best day, 14 for 25, 149, two touchdowns, did have two interceptions on the day as well. The receiving core for Emory and Henry did step up. Cam Abshire, Jakari Mazel, and Cam Peoples, all with 50-plus yards, a couple touchdowns mixed in there as well, but defense. Defensively, that's where the Wasps really had things going. Had three guys with 10 tackles apiece, four of them with TFLs, and then, of course, two guys with interceptions through the airs. Jacob Robinson ends up having a day for the Wasps. Had the interception, returned 25 yards, and then nine tackles on the day as well. So, certainly stepped up there. Seems like a very noteworthy win, something that can shake up the Southern Athletic Conference when it comes to that. Now, Let's move over to something a little bit different. How about a little bit of RMAC play? We're going to talk a lot about this game later with Jason Tommy, so I'll keep it semi-short and brief. The Mavs from Mesa. These teams have been playing. They played Colorado School of Mines. They went 14-13. to How about that mascot right there? That was badass. They went 14-13. to These teams have been playing since 1975. That is incredible. You saw a couple tackles right there. This defense was flying around the field on Saturday. It had been 1,078 days since an RMAC team had knocked off the Ore Diggers. That team back in 2021, well, it was the Mavericks from Colorado Mesa. They do it again. Take home the Nikos Cup. And uh, I will show you a couple pictures of this thing because it is pretty badass. And uh, admittedly, I can only really find photos that... Um, were held by the ore diggers because they have not, uh, Mesa has not had this trophy in a few years. This is at least a good look at the NICO, NICO's Cup, excuse me, and kind of what it details. Nothing like crazy significant about the actual model of the trophy, but uh, still a pretty cool deal, a rivalry deal out there in Colorado, and a big time moment for this Mesa program that is taking it home for the first time in what, three seasons now, correct? So a big time win for them. Like I said, we'll talk more about that with Jason Tommy later in the show. Now, Let's keep things moving here. We've got uh, a late touchdown lifting the uh, Augie Vikings, excuse me, over the Minnesota Duluth Bulldogs. Big shout out to Dakota News Now for these highlights as we go through and talk about this game. Augustana taking on Minnesota Duluth. They end up winning this one 28 24. Great bounce back win for this Vikings team who were dropped from the top 25 last week. They lost a close game to Moorhead, who's been kind of up and down inside of the NSIC play this year. It was the third consecutive game with over 100 receiving yards for Augie's. Jack Fisher. That seems like a uh, pretty important statistic and one that uh, we ought to keep track of. And you look at some of this tape as well. It's not like they uh, totally shut down this uh, Duluth offense. You see Wall Jasper here get on the left side, built like an absolute tank, diving for the pylon. Kyle M1 Abrams, Wall Jasper. They maybe need to trademark that one from me. Uh, but this one, a lot of great performances offensively. Wall Jasper actually was pretty efficient through the air as well. Uh, but unfortunately for him, Augustana gets the job done and cleans things up defensively. Augie didn't run the ball particularly well in this one. We talked about Jack Fisher with a breakout performance. Eight catches, 148, and a touchdown through the air. That certainly seems noteworthy. And then Augie on defense had four different guys with TFLs in the backfield. Uh, five different pass breakups in the day, which, you know, sometimes those are kind of finicky. So the fact that they're getting uh, mentioned in the box score means they are certainly 
certainly legit. So, uh, big time win for Augie as the NSIC continues to cannibalize one another over there in the uh, Minnesota and other regions kind of going on over there. But, keep things moving forward here. How about the biggest matchup in the GLIAC, one of the best conferences in D2 football this week? Number two, Grand Valley State visiting Davenport, a closely unranked Davenport that was receiving a lot of votes prior to this week. We'll see if that changes because the Lakers take down the Panthers 27-7. to Here's some of the highlights from this one down in, I do believe, right in Grand Rapids where Davenport is located. The Lakers seemingly back to playing Grand Valley State football. This squad has looked incredibly competent the last two weeks. You talk about that big-time win over West Florida and now a win over a very potent Davenport squad. They had that game that played a little bit too close for comfort against that UWL team a few weeks back, a prominent D3 squad, but this time they took care of business. They led 24-7 to at half. Neither team scored in the second half. You see that man right there, Avery Moore, back to slinging it down the field. He had a couple of big-time receivers make plays for him over the course of this one. And, uh, you know, he spread the ball out. That Grand Valley offense spread the ball out incredibly well. Had two, four, six, eight, ten, maybe nine or ten different Lakers hauling in catches on the day. Eichelberger, as you see him right there, continues to be an absolute monster in the offensive backfield. He finishes this one for 13 carries, 104 yards, doesn't get into the end zone. But again, this Grand Valley offense is so multidimensional. Avery Moore slinging the ball all the way around. You had Kyle Knott, of course, doing his thing. Jordan Johnson, Kenneth Jones, Kenyon Owens. And then you go down the list, there's a lot of different people that got involved. And I think you look at this, Kellen Reed isn't even on that list. Kellen Reed's one of the better receivers for that Grand Valley State squad. He's not even on that list. So a lot of really good things. If you're a uh, Grand Valley State Lakers fan, they seem to be catching their stride at the right time, right when you get into conference play. And they did it against a really quality conference opponent in Davenport. So big time win for the Lakers. Ground and pound has certainly become the name of this Grand Valley State offense. Eating up clock, 51 carries as a team for GVSU combined, that feels pretty incredible. And that's something that's really tough to stop if you're Davenport or literally anyone lining up across from them. Grand Valley did have an interception in the end zone that stopped the Davenport drive early on. And uh, the GVSU defense allowed 89 yards total in the second half combined rushing and passing. Really tough to win against the Grand Valley State squad like that, them and Harding looking almost untouchable right now, but uh, that could be the best jinx or the worst jinx, depending on uh, what side of the ball you're rooting for. Let's move to a team that has been really exciting to watch, another team that has been doing a lot of the ground and pound, that being the Carson Newman Eagles. They play host to Barton, and Carson Newman in a pretty close matchup, they take down Barton 28-17. to They are in the top 25 poll. I believe they've actually gotten bumped up a few spots as of this week, but Carson Newman takes the win in this one. You see here, though, the start of the game, that's not Carson Newman scoring the ball. That's Barton taking back the opening kick for a score. You look at this game. Barton scored 17 points. The Carson Newman defense did not allow a touchdown. They scored 17, but the Carson Newman defense did not allow a touchdown. You see them get into the triple option here. How about a little trickery on the reverse? Coming up field, breaking that one off. They had a couple guys have really big days with this Carson Newman offense. But going back to this defense, did not allow a touchdown. The second touchdown was a scoop and score in the second quarter for Barton. So this defense was actually, I mean, incredibly lights out. The Eagles now 5-0, and 3-0 and in conference play down there in the South Atlantic Conference. The victory gave them their first 5-0 and start since 2007. And their first five-game winning streak since the 2019 season. It is the 13th 5-0 opening to a football campaign in Carson Newman history. And that might seem like not a crazy number. This is a storied program, folks. It's a program, the program that's been around and had success. So for them to be up there with some of those teams is certainly very, very impressive. So going through, we'll continue to watch the tape on this one. But I wanted to highlight some of the individual performances here. And I would be remiss if I did not start with Jaden Sullins. 31 carries, 261 yards, and a touchdown. For Jaden Sullins out of the backfield for Carson Newman. He was joined by the likes of Jeremiah Carroll, Don Bradley, Cam Ferguson, some of the uh, the usual weapons there for the Eagles. Zane Whitson at quarterback, 5 for 7, 59 yards there. But that's not what they have him back there to do. They have the big boys up front to move the pile, keep the drives going for this Carson Newman squad. Barton on the other side of things, 
they actually had almost no success running the ball. Finished with 33 yards on the ground, only threw for 164. So really a, not a great day to be a Barton Bulldog offensively. This is the second touchdown I was referring to. The scoop and score, a little bit of a strip sack. Potentially, I guess that's how it would go down in the stat book on the quarterback. That one returned for almost 90 yards. That hurts. But... Sign of a good team is able to bounce back and do that. Carson Newman certainly answered the bell in that regard. Went into halftime up 21-17. This is a pretty close game. Carson Newman gets the only score of the second half in front of, it looks like, 3,500 people down there at uh, Berktar Stadium. So, big-time win for the Eagles. Don't be surprised if we continue to talk about them because they continue to play some damn good football down there. So, exciting win for them. Let's keep things moving. How about number nine, Slippery Rock, at number 21, IUP, in, I believe, what was the only top 25 ranked matchup in all of the country for this slate this week. Slippery Rock takes this one, 33-32 over the Crimson Hawks. A lot of great things coming out of this one. You look at offensively, kind of what was going on here. Karst Hunter, Braden Long, two names we've talked a lot about on this one. Braden Long, 22 for 31, 205, three touchdowns, did have an interception. Karst Hunter, pretty solid on his side as well. 15 for 29, 181, and three tuds through the air. The thing about Hunter, though, he ran for 113 yards and another touchdown with his feet. So accounted for four on the day and uh, just about 300 yards total. He was the entirety of this IUP offense. Just not enough to get it done for them when it was all said and done. Slippery Rock, kind of the difference here, had a little bit better of a rushing attack when it comes down to it. A lot less negative plays for the Rock in this one. You look at the time of possession, they had about five minutes better there. Both these teams' defense is stepping up big time on third down. They were a combined four of 20, both these teams, on third down throughout the entirety of this one. But the crazy part on the flip side of that is both these teams were a perfect four for four in the red zone. So two offenses that certainly know how to score, combined with two defenses that are great on critical key downs, this is the result you get. 33-32 uh, game where the Slippery Rock team right now, that is a very, very important win for this Slippery Rock football team. Look at some of their wins leading up to this point. That's their second game of PSAC play. They opened the, the year uh, with a really quality win over a New Haven squad, and now they're 5-0. and 2-0 and inside a PSAC play. Coming down the barrel, you got Gannon, California PA, Clarion, Seton Hill, and Bloomsburg. No shot at any of those teams, right? There is not a team on that list I don't think Slippery Rock is going to take down and take down handedly. This Rock team right now looks really good, and if IUP was not going to stop them, I don't believe anyone in the PSAC on the schedule, anyone in the PSAC on the schedule will. Obviously, you've got Kutztown that's ranked up there in that kind of Power 10 ranking. There's a very good chance that PSAC championship game will feature the Bears and the Rock once again. But let's uh, talk a couple more stats about this one. Some last-minute heroics, though, to take things off for Slippery Rock. Right here, barely any time left in the fourth quarter. Braden Long lofts this one up to the back corner of the end zone. Mike Solomon, 12 seconds left. Slippery Rock, that would be the score that decided it. I certainly don't want to make it seem like it was a wire-to-wire -wire win for Slippery Rock. IUP had them on the ropes throughout the entirety of this game, but when it came down to it, the Rock makes some timely plays offensively to close this things out. The Hawks would bounce back. They had a 54-yard field goal attempt that was no good that uh, you know could have potentially made things interesting here and forced some extra football. More than 6,000 people in attendance for this one. That's a ridiculous number. I love that for D2 football. Slippery Rock, in their last 39 games against PSAC West schools, is 37-2. and two. I'm going to leave you with that as we talk about this one. So, big time score for uh, Braden Long and company over there in Slippery Rock to get the job done against the Crimson Hawks. Let's keep things going. One of our last kind of highlighted games today, another big time upset. This time, though, Sioux Falls taking down number seven, Minnesota State. This game was all over the place. I'm going to tr play kind of sparingly a couple of the touchdowns for the Cougars as I talk about this one. Here's one of them late in the third quarter. This game was 30-9 to in the third quarter. You're about to see the touchdown that, excuse me, would make it 30-9 to for this Sioux Falls team. How about a little dump off here over the middle and a scramble? 
for about 50 to 60 yards to the end zone. And of course, Twitter's going to go ahead and black out on the video there. But that is a big time score. Those uniforms are beautiful for the Sioux Falls squad. I, I dare say those are awesome. A statement win, though, for Coach Glow in year two at Sioux Falls. He was the former DC at Mankato, was there for seven years, had a lot of success with this Maverick squad, goes over to take the head job at Sioux Falls, an in conference squad over there on the NSIC. And then this is what he does he comes back and he beats Mankato and he does it on their home field. So that was one of the big time scores for this Sioux Fall squad. This uh, had a couple of other good plays right here for you as we move along. Here's another big time touchdown. I don't know. That was the same one. But um, going through and looking at this one, you know, there were some big time plays in here for both these squads. We talk about some of the individual performances. Hey, Necker is certainly coming to his own for that Minnesota State squad. He's a quarterback that has gone from a quarterback that's not going to lose you a game to now a quarterback that is going to go out and win you games. And obviously, wasn't able to do it in this one, but that's not of any fault of his own. 26 of 41, 317, and three touchdowns. That's something. He also rushed for 16 yards. He has the ability to do stuff with his legs um, as far as getting out and making some plays outside of the tackle box, but didn't see a whole lot of that inside of this one. The rushing attack from Sioux Falls was certainly very solid. Camden Dean had a good day through the air. Four touchdowns, did have two turnovers. Receiving-wise, Gabe Hagen from uh, Minnesota State at eight catches, 125 and two touchdowns. How about Carter Slekius? Hopefully it got that one correct. Seven catches, 147, and two touchdowns. Some great offensive performances from both of these squads. Kai West, defensive back from Minnesota State, coming up with that big-time interception. How about eight tackles and half a TFL on the day, too? He's someone that they really like over there in that defensive secondary for Mankato. But again, uh, the biggest storyline is Coach Glow. Year two at Sioux Falls, comes back, has a big statement win against this Mankato squad. That is uh, certainly noteworthy. But quick hitters here. Before we go over to D3 football, Clark Atlanta, their unbeaten season ends at the hands of FCS Savannah State, 35-28. They're taken down. They had some heroics last week against Bethune Cookman with that big-time field goal, but their unbeaten season comes to an end. Still a lot going on for that squad. But don't look now. West Virginia State, 4-1, and 3-0 and in MEC play after a 45-34 win, excuse me, over Fairmont State on Saturday. West Virginia State. I was not familiar with your game. That is a big time win. You guys are 3-0 and in conference play. Not a team we talked about enough. Certainly might have to more going down, moving forward with the show here. Outscored Fairmont 35-3 in the fourth quarter. At this rate now for this West Virginia State team, their game versus Charleston November 16th could be for the MEC title. So keep an eye on that. Johnson C. Smith, they keep things going versus Virginia State. They win 21-17, a statement win for that Golden Bulls squad. How about UND outlasting William Jewell in overtime 23-20 for what, all things considered, will probably be the GLVC title. That game is probably going to be the one that determines it. Winona takes out Moorhead 33-6. to They limit the dynamic passing attack over there for the Dragons. They uh, force two interceptions through the air from off the arm of Jack Strand. Another NSIC, two more of them matchups. Concordia St. Paul beats you, Mary, in double overtime 19-13. to And Northern State with the upset of Bemidji State 14-13. NSIC right now is cannibalism across the board. I'm here for it. A lot of great football being played over there. Finally, Fort Hayes State, they knock off number 12, UCM, 21-7. The second time the Mules have been knocked off by unranked foes this year. And that's no fluke. Fort Hayes State, Central Oklahoma, these are not just your run-of-the-mill unranked games. These are teams that are incredibly competent in a really good conference down there in the NBAA. 